Dear you all, welcome to Anamet Library Talk. At today's talk, we have distinguished speaker, speakers with us, Suyuz Anderson and Beyza Uzunkutlay. Today's talk is entitled The Digital Future of Museums, Con Conservations and Provocations. Digital technology once seemed to promise museums the opportunity to democratize their work, making collections available to all. To what extent has this once imagined future come true? In this talk, Suze Anderson will look back to the recent past in museums to consider how digital technology has created new opportunities for critical engagement before asking where we might need to go next. How can museums make thoughtful, responsible choices about digital technology in an era of machine learning and artificial intelligence? What are the ethical considerations for museums as they choose how and where to participate in a world increasingly defined by network technologies? At this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Suze Anderson joined the faculty of the George Washington University in 2016 and currently serves as program head and graduate advisor in the Museum Studies program. For much of her career, her research focused in intersection of museums and technology. More recently, Dr. Anderson has become concerned with investigation, contemporary ethical dilemmas confronting the museum field. She is the co-author with Dr. Keir Weinsmith of The Digital Future of Museums, Con Conversations and Provocations and former host and producer of Museopunks, the podcast for the Progressive Museum. As an instructor, Anderson seeks to practice a pedagogy of care while also encouraging students to engage in critical consolidation of the role of museums in society today and into the future. Beyza Uzunkutla is a creator of the Turkish and Islamic art collection at the Saad Berkana Museum in Istanbul. She received her PhD in 2023 from IMT, Lucas Department of Analysis and Management of Cultural, Cultural Heritage, with a thesis titled Between the Transnational and the Local, Assessing the Changing Profile of the Islamic Art Collections in the Museum of Turkey. Uzun Kutlay's research examines how state museums in Turkey, particularly the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Arts in Istanbul have showcased their Islamic art collections within the evolving context of, of global and local museology. Her work focuses on the unique social, cultural, and political factors that have influenced museum practices for the late 19th century to the present. Dear attendees, please bear in mind that your video and audios are closed. Uh, please type your questions in the chat section. Your questions will be answered in Q&A session. Now I am passing the word to Beza. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Ram, and thank you all for joining us. And of course, thank you, Suze, for accepting the invitation of Anamed Library for this talk. And also thank you for having me here as a moderator. Uh, I will try to assist Suze uh, at the end of the, uh, her presentation. Um, you can, as Iram just said, you can share your comments or questions uh, via the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we will uh, discuss all of it. And thank you again. Uh, uh, and now the floor is yours, too. Thank you. Thank you, Iram and Beza. It is so lovely to be here with you today. So thank you also to the Anamed Library Talks for hosting this conversation. Um, as Adam said, my name is Suze Anderson and I'm the current program head and associate professor of museum studies at George Washington University. I'm also a white woman who uses she, her pronouns. I am currently wearing a dark olive green shirt with a copper necklace, an asymmetrical copper necklace that is sort of peeking in and out of the neckline. I have green glasses on and my hair is back. Um, I'm currently located in Baltimore, Maryland, on the east coast of Australia, on the unceded land of the Pascataway, Lumbee and Cherokee peoples. 
Um, it's really lovely to be in conversation with you. If I end up speaking too quickly at any point, if there's anything you don't understand, please just drop a line in the chat and I'll try and pay attention and slow down a little bit. I also apologize in advance. Apparently, my city council has decided now is the appropriate moment to start digging up a road outside my house. Hopefully we will not be um, overwhelmed with noise, but if that happens, we will make do and apologize. Um, this is a really interesting opportunity for me to give this talk. Um, this book, this publication, The Digital Future of Museums, um, came out several years ago now. And in that time, my focus as a researcher has started to shift. I spent um, as it said in the introduction, I spent about a decade or slightly longer really thinking about the impact of technology on museums and their practice. But in the last few years, I've been teaching a core course in our museum studies program on museum ethical dilemmas called Museum Ethics and Values. And I've just started writing something that I hope will be a book for that. And I really noticed how much when I was sort of trying to put this talk together, how much my head was in quite a different space. So hopefully I will still make sense. I will be coherent. I also want to acknowledge that um, the context in which this was written, um, it was a very specific time and place that has given shape to this publication. And I'm going to unpack a little bit of that for you now, because I think it's really relevant to some of the, the big conversations happening in the field or not happening in the field. Um, Beza, as an aside, Beza is going to be um, changing my slides for me. We were having uh, some slight technical difficulties, so I'm going to let Beza know whenever I need a slide change. So Beza, now is time for the first one. Um, so to introduce the book, I really have to introduce my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Hugh Weinsmith. Um, Kia is the current Chief Digital Officer at the National Film and Sound, Sound or the National Film and Sound Archive in Australia. Um, he's also uh, the co-founder and a big supporter of the bi-monthly cultural data salon in Sydney, Australia. Um, and he's been a mentor in the um, Australia Council and uh, the ACME Digital Mentoring Program. At around the time that Kia and I started working on this project together, Kia was living in the US, much like I am currently living in the US. He was working as the director of digital experience and the head of web and digital at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where he co-founded and led the SF MoMA Lab. So Kia had deep experience, deep technological, technical experience working within museums and working with museum technology. I was in a somewhat different position. Um, I had come to museums um, in many ways by accident. And although I had worked in museums and technology, so much of my work and so much of my experience had really been theoretical. It had been done in my PhD. And very early in my PhD, where I was focused on thinking about what the changing infrastructure um, for knowledge, meant for museums as knowledge institutions, I started doing a lot of public writing projects and really participating in this public discourse around museums. Can I get you to change slide, Beza? So I, in about 2011, I went to my first um, big museum conference, which was Museums on the Web in Philadelphia uh, in the US. And while I was there, I met several people who were working and thinking about museum technology um, quite publicly. It was through conferences, it was on blogs, it was on social media platforms, particularly Twitter. Um, and I started doing some of that myself. So my early entry into the museum discourse was really a kind of public writing and sort of playing with um, thinking about and writing about museums in public. Um, in uh, about 2013, I think we put this together, uh, two of my then uh, colleagues and friends, Rob Stein and Ed Rodley, both of whom also were part of this sort of quite public discourse. We 
decided we wanted to do an, a publishing experiment called Code Words. We really wanted to try and bring together some writing about museums and technology and the web um, using, at that stage, we were using the website Medium to publish sort of longer pieces, but that were um, written quite responsibly and, and sort of that might speak to one another. Uh, next next slide, Beza. That that was published then later as a book. In 2018, um, uh, after attending a conference, the Museum Computer Network Conference, uh, conference uh, otherwise known as MCN, at the end of the conference, some, some friends and colleagues and I thought, oh, I really want to have captured what was happening in this conference. And so we put together what we called unproceedings from the conference. We had no plans for trying to document the conference until after the conference had happened. And we put a public call out to people who had attended the conference that um, we would be really interested in their perspectives if they wanted to write and share the work they'd been doing or the impressions that they'd had. So in the two months following the conference, we put together um, a website which was also printed. We used the Getty's Choir platform Form, which is a really great flexible publishing platform. Um, we used Choir to create this publication called Humanizing the Digital, Unproceedings from the MCN 2018 conference. Um, I give this context because this kind of publishing, this kind of conversational um, community of practice was really essential to the kind of um, context in which human, uh, the digital future of museums as a publication came to be. Slide Beza. At the same time, I was also um, involved in uh, a podcast. So myself and initially Jeffrey Insko, um, and then later on um, Ed Rodley, amongst others, we hosted a um a, a podcast called Museo Punks. And Museo Punks was the podcast for the Progressive Museum that had started with a focus on technology subjects, although broadened from there. But the way it was structured, uh, Jeffrey and I at the very beginning, this was in 2013 when we started it, we were always really interested in pairing um, usually two speakers who could come at a topic from quite different perspectives, who could um, come and inform uh, uh, listeners with the the kinds of um, sort of different insight or different input from from dealing with um, a topic from different perspectives. Um, slide Beza. So that is what what started to inform the way we approach the museum uh, book. So Kia and I actually started this book at a conference, but perhaps weirdly um, at karaoke. Um, we were side by side at karaoke talking about the magic that happens when you are in a small conversation with one or two other people who are coming at a problem from multiple perspectives and who really help unlock something for you, who help you understand something, who help you um, move forward in your thinking. And so for many years within the technology space, conferences, blogs, social media, and more formal publications really played a critical role in the development of a discourse around digital practice and its meaning within cultural institutions. Kia and I were both attending, presenting at, moderating and programming conferences, symposia and workshops for, you know, 10 or 15 years together and doing that work alongside our more formal work. In my case, that was um, teaching in museum studies programs. It was working in museums. It was also doing my PhD in Kia's place. Uh, it was, you know, working sort of in sort of deeply technological and technical positions, whilst also in leadership positions within museums and the museum field at large. We both happen to find ourselves on the board of, the, of MCN, the Museum Computer Network at the same time. And, and as I say, this sort of appreciation of the richness of the conversation led us 
to wanting to try and capture that in a more formal structure. So Kia had the initial idea for this publication um, where he's like, we want to try and capture these conversations that happen um, on the side of a conference where they happen sort of in informal environments where they really help bring insight and understanding. So that was the basic idea behind the, the publication and the way we approached it. In each case, we became really interested in pairing um, two individuals who could help us unlock or think about a topic from a different perspective. And so we came to some core perspectives or some core topics that we thought were relevant and interesting, not trying to be all encompassing, but trying to speak to critical issues about um, technology in museums at a particular moment, um, whilst also asking each participant in these conversations to really think about what they thought was coming up, what they thought the different futures of museums might be. And in some cases, those futures were relatively static. The future didn't seem overly different from the past. And in others, it seemed to be sort of expansive and generative in ways that were surprising and interesting. Um, the conversations were relatively loose and open. They didn't have a formal agenda in a lot of time, in a lot of cases. We had a loose set of questions. Um, and Kia really ran those conversations. We'd initially thought that um, we would share them and then I got quite pregnant, um, well, as pregnant as a normal person gets, I suppose, um, but my pregnancy happened to coincide with some of our timelines. And so Kia ended up running the interviews and I ended up then editing them and trying to pull them together for themes and creating sort of this overarching essay that exists at the start of the book. Um, Beza, can I get you to... Um, give us the next slide so no book launch March 2020 can anyone you can pop it in the chat uh tell me what else happened in March 2020 hopefully it has not gone from memory I'm not sure if I'm I'm maybe not seeing the chat but there is a fairly significant hit in COVID yes so next slide Beza it turns out that in March 2020, it was a global pandemic. Um, so our book about the future of museum practice was published right at the start of the global pandemic. In fact, the first month. And of course, immediately, the challenges that museums were facing seemed and were significantly different from the moment that we had been writing our book. Um, what I'd really love to do is sort of prompt you, you know, we, don't, we can't have a broad conversation in webinar mode at this moment, um, but one of the things I'd really prompt you to start thinking about is some of the differences you noticed or might have imagined at that time uh, as a result of the pandemic. Because, of course, the sector started to change significantly. Um, even prior to the pandemic's overwhelming effects, which, of course, unsettled museum practice and personal life and routine, um, one of the things that we wrote about at the start of the book that I think really continued to hold strong is we were living in what um, Ziadine Sadar calls post-normal times which are characterised by uncertainty and rapid change and realignment of power, by upheaval and chaotic behaviour. Sarah's Welcome to Post-Normal Times really helps us to find complexity, chaos and contradiction as core to the way life happens. The nearly impossible to comprehend, highly connected and filled with tensions leading to uncertainty and risk bringing into question the conventional or normalised modes of thinking and behaviour. How true that concept which we had used to introduce our book sort of became and was reinforced in the way that museums were trying to deal with and grapple with sort of the technological environment. 
Now, this, I would argue, has not reduced, although we have moved to a, a different kind of normal and in some ways settled back into um, older versions of normal. In some ways, what we experience now may not be as different as we might have anticipated. Um, or there might be some ways that things seem the same. But there have been some critical differences that I think are really important to draw attention to. Um, slide beza. One of them, and one of the things that I wanted to sort of draw attention to in this talk, is that there has been a real diminishment in the infrastructure for the kinds of discourse that was happening around museum technology before now. Um, the not found URL um, sign here is actually from um, a website on the Museums and the Web page. MuseWeb, the Museums and the Web conference, had been this critical part of museum technology infrastructure since 1997. And it faded away and is now seemingly gone completely um, in large part as a result of the COVID pandemic. Other conferences have also faded away. Um, Museums in the Web in particular had a, a massive archive of papers that every conference there had been papers discussing and thinking about the state of museum technology in the present. And those papers in many cases can no longer be found. We have lost them. Um, we no longer have this sort of critical space for conversation and community of practice that this, um, this conference, but also this archive of papers made possible in terms of thinking about how we come to establish what practice is, where we go from there, how we share ideas and work through them together. Oftentimes the way blogs and conversations would work um, a, a conference session would happen at one space and then be picked up in another place. The conversation would develop and then a year later, that same conversation would be revisited. And in large part because of the pandemic, although also because of changing technological infrastructure. So in the US at least, Twitter had been this very significant part of the technological infrastructure for museums and technology conversation. And when it was sold, when it also became a place for um, significantly um, less robust discourse where there was increased misinformation, fewer museum professionals were participating in that space and moving away. We also lost jobs in certainly the technology space, um, but also other spaces within museums people moved into different parts of the field. And so what we've seen is this breaking of infrastructure for the development of ideas and for the creation of a shared understanding of practice at a time when technology was or, and has continued to move forward in significant and relatively sort of unsettling ways. Slide beza. So early conceptions of cyberspace, of the web, imagined it as a world where that all may enter without privilege or prejudice accorded by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. Um, that's a quote from 1996 uh, from Barlow. And then we had social media come to prominence in the mid 2000s where it was sort of lauded as this triumph for democracy, where new platforms and accessible tools for the creation of content lowered the barriers to participation in online spaces. Suddenly there was this massive influx of participants in public and semi-public online spaces. This reconfigured notions of publicness as more people began to participate in online discourse and the online modes of authorship and authority came into question. We started to see the rise of influence of individual creators who could bypass traditional gatekeepers of knowledge and access, informing news organizations, governments, um, universities, and museums 
um, in thinking about how they wanted to create and how they wanted to make available their content. Um, there were new ways to organize as well, and they became powerful forces for change in those mechanisms of organization. That was true in both developed and in developing countries and communities. But even as the internet seemed to create, you know, increased democracy through participatory practices, we started to see some practices that created problems and complexity in that. For instance, certain users were prevented from seeing opportunities through digital redlining, which sort of limited algorithmically what people started to have access to. Digital inequality indeed starts to exacerbate educational and income inequality. For the potential for museums, uh, for, so for the internet to create open, transparent and democratic systems of communication, what we've now seen is sort of a network splintered into disjointed platforms and disenfranchised user base with corporations that are seeking profit and power. I think, for instance, Google has something like 90% of the search engine share around the world. And so really Google, that is a platform link, linking capitalism, it links advertising along with search results, along with knowledge, it's really dictating how and where people get their information. These tech giants have become so powerful in their specific parts of the market that law professor Frank Pascal argues that they're functionally sovereign effectively structuring the markets um, so that they can control, simultaneously control the platforms and the mechanisms of access with relatively little regulation and transparency. So we had this broad set of technological protocols that seem to enable openness and transparency and access and democracy or democratization. But it's now harder to argue that those same platforms are enabling the same kinds of things. There's so many global participants that it has become increasingly difficult to sort of find what you're looking for. And again, we have come down to sort of very specific gatekeepers limiting the access to information. Um, slide Baser. So, where should museums locate themselves in the context of this? How should museums respond to these circumstances? What are our ethical responsibilities and how do we balance those with our desire for relevance and meaning in a world that's increasingly mediated by digital technologies, where we have very little control over the large platforms, over how they're used, over their governance structures, where really we are sort of in constant state of compromise. Slide. I want to spend a little bit of time with digitization because I think digitization has been um, a revolutionary part of changing how museums function as um, not just part of the web, but as public institutions. Back in 2011, I, you know, as I was preparing for this talk, I went back to a talk I gave you know, 13 years ago in 2011, um, Australia was coming up with a new cultural policy and I was invited to participate in the digital culture public sphere, which sought um, sort of participation from multiple perspectives within um, those thinking about digital practice within the museum field. This was really in the early days of museums putting their collections online and I was full of potential for the, you know, full of optimism for the potential of that action. Here's what I wrote. Who knows what possibilities for new discovery, new knowledge and new insight lie hidden in the collections of our museums, galleries, libraries and archives. Digitizing our collections and making them available online in usable forms will lead to incredible new opportunities for cultural institutions to gain new relevance in the global knowledge economy. 
I think that's absolutely true. And it was a really hopeful vision that I still hold on to, but it's become more nuanced in the years since. So I imagined a world where museums moved further into a role of care and custodianship over our collections that exist deeply in the service of different publics that would be connected by digital technologies. Um, slide. So I think there are some important ways that this vision has come true. And I'm gonna talk about a few different ones. Um, one lives in the context of artificial intelligence. So there are exciting new discoveries that are being made as a result of museums digitizing their collections. For instance, in 2022, Nicolas Gautier joined the Florida Museum of Natural History as its first curator of artificial intelligence. Um, and he was responsible for developing machine learning methods to better understand museum collections. Gautier used AI to help analyze data from the Southwest Social Networks database, which included 4.3 million artifacts from nearly 500 archeological sites to examine the relationship between hydroclimate variability, distance, and social interaction over a 250 year span. So one of the ways that I think it is really exciting museums have been digitizing their collections is when we can start to look at, digit at collections at scale rather than in focus, we can start to make new kinds of knowledge. This is part and consistent with the movement towards big data, sort of an analysis of big data, which has become so critical to understanding how the web has been functioning for, for um, the last you know, 10 or 15 years, 15 years, I'd say, where we have massive accumulation of data that we can start to analyze in new ways and understand differently. We can start to ask new questions of that kind of data. And when we can link together cultural collections, when we can link together large cultural data, we can start to analyze those cultural data sets in new ways to come up with new kinds of knowledge. Um, slide. Another example of this um, is the way opening up uh, museum collections has enabled new discoveries by non-experts. Again, this goes to this idea of participatory practice and, and the notion that if you open up museum collections to those who haven't previously had access to them, we get a real broadening of the kind of possible publics who can use these collections to make new knowledge, to make new discovery and new creativity. Um, in a lovely example, one of my former students shared with me, uh, this is Chris Mul Mulaney, my, sh my student, shared with me Bennett Bacon, who is a London-based furniture conservator and amateur archaeologist, used information and imagery of cave art paintings that was available via the British Library and online to look for, paint, uh, for patterns in the markings of uh, reindeer, cattle, oop, nope, um, bison and fish. Um, and Bacon found several patterns, which he reached out to professors at two universities for further analysis. And uh, last year, the group published a peer-reviewed paper proposing that Ice Age hunter-gatherers had used a kind of proto-writing system to track the reproduction cycles of wild animals. And expanding access to museum collections, we've also expanded the potential for new people to ask questions of those collections and we're gonna get new kinds of collections, which is amazing. Now we can, now we can change Phaser. Um, but I think what I'm most excited about as we've moved towards the digitization of cultural collections and as that practice has matured, it's increasingly in the ways that the online presence of these collections has enabled people from around the world to critically engage with and ask questions of the institutions themselves. Questions such as, why is this in the collection? How did it get here? And who is benefiting from its presence? One of the reasons I think these questions are so important and so 
critical. I, I mentioned two slides back that we're really thinking about how we change the notion of the museum as a public institution. We're thinking about it in terms of care and custodianship of collections and making our collections more public. That we are in a context where so much knowledge and the ways knowledge is produced and shared with us is obscured from sight. We do not know how Google's algorithms work, how they serve us knowledge. As we move into context of increasing reliance on artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning, the kinds of algorithms that are informing what comes to us, what we're able to see and access are so often invisible to us. It is hard to trace where knowledge has come from and how that knowledge has been put together. And so it is beautiful and amazing that museums, as they put their collections online, start to enable us to critically engage with those collections, to critique them and to see the gaps in them because they have been rendered visible where previously they had been invisible. One of the most important projects in the field that I, I think right now is digi uh, Digital Benin. You can see a screenshot from it. It simultaneously works alongside museums to create new knowledge and to create this, to, to critique those same institutions. When uh, Digital Benin was launched relatively recently, um, it united data from more, uh, from more than 5,200 objects that were looted by British forces from the Kingdom of Benin, now Edo State and Nigeria, after a violent colonial attack. The Benin objects are currently located in 131 institutions in 20 countries. And this project starts to connect the digital documentation about dispersed objects to oral histories, provenance information and object research. It provides deep historical context as well as a map of, Benin, of the Benin Kingdom and the museum collections worldwide. One of the most exciting features is an Edo language catalogue. And the project as a whole prioritizes Nigerian users and brings an Edo-centric focus to the embeddedness of knowledges, traditions, and histories of the objects. The website includes thoughtful discussion about the use of derogatory, racist, and harmful language, and argues that it seeks to push institutions to consider the terminology they use to avoid re-traumatizing source community members. Slide. Um, Although the expansive digital content is exciting in itself, one of the things that I think is really important is the project methodology, which I think is worth spending some time with. All of the institutional data included on the website from images and 3D scans to information about the object provenance, uh, condition and curatorial research was shared by the contributing museums. The metadata processes, including creating strategy that could simultaneously preserve institutional data structures, whilst also enabling users to search across data sets. The project therefore creates a new set of online histories of these objects, which makes visible their relationships and draws attention to the colonial violence that led to their dispersal to institutions around the world. It helps us ask new questions of the, these histories and continues to expand the experience of these objects. That it sees the objects and the history as living and continuing of dynamic. Years ago, um, I, I first encountered the notion that um, museum collections, when we put them back into um, into the web, into sort of online context, we recomplexify the objects. We make them newly complex. So when museums take objects out, they put them into a very sort of pristine, at least in theory, context where they are removed from their initial context, where they are put within a very specific narrative structure of a museum where their relationships are made in context of other museum objects. When we move objects back into the web, when we put them back online, we re-complexify them, we give them 
new connections and new stories and new use cases whereby they can be used and imagined in different ways. Um, in an examination of the ethnographic collections of Benin works in museums uh, in Switzerland, Alex Herzog and Ainai Bokan uh, Esbu Imaragbi identified four strategies for critically engage engaging with archival material in museums that I think are relevant. These are to identify the perceptions and practices of those who produced museum documentation, to provide access to a broader audience, to decolonize museum archives by actively reaching out and engaging directly with concerned communities, incorporating their voices into the archive. And the fourth strategy identified by the audience, by the authors comes from the Indigenous Archives Collective in their 2021 position statement, Right of Reply, Indigenous Rights in Data and Collections. The statement asserts the right of Indigenous peoples to challenge and respond to their information and knowledges contained in archival records held in galleries, libraries, archives, and museum institutions through a right of reply. Slide. I want to give you a little bit more about those statement principles and that right to reply. Those statement principles, um, which come from, um, in particular, the um, museum context in Australia. Sorry, I'm just gonna, I've lost, there's a little quote I was gonna give. It has gone, I will, I will come back to where I was. Um, these statement principles are the right to know. So without an authoritative source to identify where relevant material is to be found, further rights such as the right of reply cannot be activated. Participation. Activations of the materials held in organizations seek to assist Indigenous peoples achieve the outcomes that they define. Cultural safety, all initiatives to activate Indigenous peoples' rights in data, information, and records about them should be undertaken to ensure the cultural safety of participants and knowledge. Consent, every opportunity for engagement with Indigenous people should be taken to support Indigenous peoples, control of their information, knowledge and representation. Institutions as facilitators, not owners. So prioritise institutional support of religious rights to manage Indigenous material according, according to culturally appropriate means. And advocacy, continual advocacy is required to prioritise the rights of Indigenous peoples in the management of cultural material. We see here the navigation, the negotiation of what we do with museum collections as we move them into online cultural contexts um, that are ethical and informed by participation and practice. I mentioned at the start of this that one of the great things about sort of the early web was its promise towards um, participatory practice. And while I do think we have moved away from those ideas of democratization within the web writ large, what we have seen is a deep influence in the way museums are approaching their practices, particularly when it comes to uh, what they are putting online. Slide, Beza. So museums have long been sites of struggle for the representation of history and culture. And online museum collections and their objects and their data, um, which often lose their form as a cohesive collection in the digital space as they sort of become re-complexified, continue in this tradition. And in the aggregate, cultural collections, can we can start to see sort of historic biases writ ever larger which is something we need to be deeply careful of and concerned with. But that visibility, that capacity to interrogate, to ask questions of, to think about critically is really important as we become increasingly obscured from knowledge. We're sort of seeing this reframing of the museum collection that has been deeply hidden to something much more visible at a time when other kinds of knowledge are often being obscured of how we get to that kind of knowledge. Um, so our museum sort of, as we're enmeshed in digital contexts, the same co collections can be used as tools 
for critique, for counter narratives, for presenting different kinds of stories, and to resist simplistic narratives of domination. I'm also going to suggest that the kind of access that the digital provides is now access to, amongst other things, those tools of critique and possibility for renegotiating power relationships with real world consequences, including repatriation and decolonization practices. But Angel David Neves and Siobhan Senya, our digital sites constitute new spatial and temporal activities within which colonial power can be disaggregated and examined. They can be living documents allowing continual revision, contest and expansion, and thus the inclusion of ever more voices and perspectives. It's possible to understand these kinds of renegotiated power relationships as something to fear, but I'd rather imagine these critical engagements with museums and their collections and their legacies as vital to the future of the institution. Each difficult conversation is a conversation that might not have happened without the prompt of digital access, but they're essential for moving museum practice forward toward more ethical, consent-based relationships that reckon with the messy histories of our, of our institution. And as the technological environment within which museums shift towards an increasing reliance on extractive data collection practices, including surveillance capitalism, algorithmic decision making, machine learning with large language models and artificial intelligence, museums then have a responsibility to grapple not with just the positive possibilities for marketing and personalization, but also the larger potentials for harm. Many of the current data practices uh, within our institutions have reinforced existing biases and power dynamics, remaking and reifying existing structures. Adriel Lewis, who's curator of digital and emerging media at the Smithsonian Asia Pacific American Center writes, data collection is not itself a colonial practice, but when it is done through harmful extraction methods, and even more so when the extraction is powered by systems built for profit and gain, uh, in, in 2021, which is when Adriel published this piece that I'm quoting from, museums throughout the world are making commitments in response to public demands for more just and equitable practices. Meanwhile, museums continue to measure their success in large part by their ability to incentivize people to engage with online platforms that are known to actively surveil and document their information in order to sell it to advertisers, governments, and miscellaneous parties. Slide. So we have been invited, and I think museums are starting to come to recognizing that um, being online today, particularly in the context of uh, artificial intelligence, means really thinking deeply about our ethical approaches to the work. Um, in, 2020, in spring 2022, the Smithsonian uh, released their AI value statement which opens with the statement that technology is not neutral. It also notes that it also um, notes that we seek to only begin AI projects that implement tools and algorithms that are respectful to the individuals and communities that are represented by the information in our museum, library, and archival collections. We aim to be proactive in identifying and documenting biases and methodologies when building and implementing such tools and making the documentation available to audiences that will interact with the resulting products. We recognize that technology evolves over time, and that our efforts must also evolve to ensure our ethical frameworks stay relevant and robust. We encourage any person, community, or stakeholder involved with or affected by said tools and algorithms to provide feedback and point out any concerns. The statement urges anyone contemplating an AI project to consider: is the appropriate uh, is the appropriate technology to solve is it the appropriate technology to solve the problem? They note the development of AI tools often requires the use of specialized computational hardware, the product the production of which relies on the mining of rare earth metals, and the operation of which can have a large carbon footprint. What is the environmental impact of choosing this technology or tool? And they further note there are no unbiased methodologies, data sets, collections, algorithms, or tools. Therefore, what are the methodologies, data sets, uh, collections, algorithms, or tools that you wish to use? Slide. We 
uh, living at a time when um, establishing the sector's ethical approaches to, to technology may be harder than they were. We have lost some of that infrastructure where the discourse was taking place around museum technology to think about what our norms were established, how we spoke through and spoke about um, the kinds of practice that we wanted to do to move forward. But ethical practice, ethical practice that is based in consent, in minimization of harm, is deeply important as museums seek to connect with more uh, communities who have been harmed through colonial sort of violence and through oppressive practices that continue to be reified in other digital spaces. We have a responsibility with our collections and to our collections, but we also have responsibilities to the many publics that we are serving and now visibly serving. I said that I thought digitization was essential in changing the museum's role as a public institution. I think it's been um, kind of incredible in the way it has enabled more contact and question and critical engagement with our collections, that we've moved from collections that were deeply visible to make them much more visible. It is a tricky technological environment in which we're working. It is a deeply complex cultural, political, economic environment in which museums are working. We can talk more about what that looks like in the conversation, but I think the, the notion that we are working towards um, practice that is thoughtful, ethical, that connects with people whose um, culture is represented and whose objects are represented in the ways that we do things, which may include not digitizing pieces. It may include keeping things offline. Um, these are all ways that we need to move forward. And that's going to be, you know, a challenge, but it's a challenge that we as a sector and as individual practitioners working within that sector must be deeply concerned with. Um, I think that's it. Uh, if you want to move to the final slide, Beza, um, it's got my um, my email address there, but that's sort of my, my, my spiel, my current thinking on museums and digital practice. Thank you very much, Zeus, for this insightful talk. I uh, I really enjoyed, um, especially um, I'm so happy to hear uh, that uh, we are aware of that there, there's no such thing as uh, objective or unbiased uh, mm. classification. And I'm happy that we are discussing this things now uh, when we are considering our collections and museum space because it's not neutral at all um, uh, and I really appreciate that you mentioned this and you emphasize this and also like bringing the uh, complexity mm. when we are discussing the objects in the collection and we are exhibiting them I also appreciate that you mentioned this that we need to bring back the complexity uh, of the um, story of the objects. I don't know if if, mm. I, uh, if I make this clear, but thank you again for this interesting talk. And I'm gonna look at our um, chat. Um, we have people are thanking for your wonderful speech, and I will. Um, I'm just. Um, we have a question actually about since you have mentioned about that. Um, let me summarize it. Uh, our um, our attendee is saying that since digitalization has become even more important for museums and cultural institutions after COVID nineteen. Will there be a new edition of the book published in March 2020? <laughs> um, 
It's a good question. At this stage, we have no plans for something, in part, I think, because um, I think it we actually need some time to pass to capture the moment. There are, you know, there are other really lovely publications that are existing. Um, you know, people do keep publishing, but I think this notion of sort of having a conversation about the field and its moment um it's actually important that we let some time pass to digest on this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been funny. I've been teaching this course on museums and digital technology um, in my teaching since 2016. And there are some parts of the class, there are certain examples that I use that were the same examples I was using um, years ago. But the way I talk about them is really different. For instance, there's a whole series of... Um, sort of in-gallery experiences that were pioneered, that were deeply important in sort of 2012, 2013, 2014, and so on, that were hugely impactful at the time. And when I would talk about them in those moments, I would talk about their impact. But over time, those particular examples started to fade away. One would get dropped by its institution, another one was sort of sunset, the funding would run out for, for a third. And so these projects that were important and influential, that dominated conversation, when we now look at them and we now think about what they were and the impact of them, they have certainly shaped thinking. But we also understand that they were experiments and 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 the way we think about them and talk about them there are different kinds of takeaways now that we've got critical distance from them and now that we've been able to digest them in different ways from what we saw them when we were sort of in the moment and even though the pandemic as pandemic is officially finished I'd argue that we're still in the moment of the pandemic maybe in a slightly less immediate way but right now in the US, for instance, there are several smaller museums that are closing. Now they are undoubtedly closing in part because of um, the longer held impact of the pandemic. Okay. So I think that it is, I think the idea of revisiting, this is a really interesting one, but I also don't think it's appropriate to revisit it yet because I think that we need time to digest mm -hmm. and I think we need time to understand the impact. Uh, I think that we are still in shock and in trauma and in grief in ways that we haven't yet grappled with and, and it's important to capture those things in lifetime, but it's actually also important to give time before we reflect upon them and really think about how we understand their impact going forward. Similarly, just to sort of put this specifically in a technological framework, two years ago, there was so much conversation about NFTs, you know, non-fungible tokens and what they might mean for museums. And the simple answer was very little because they were nothing more than a, a blip, a trend. They were arguably um, something that people were trying to capitalize and make money sort of uh, by gambling on um digital futures in a way that really hasn't had long-term impact. So, you know, I, I think this is one of the things when we think about museums and technology, it's really important that we're thinking about now and we're thinking about what's emerging and coming and how we might want to um, move forward through that practice. But oftentimes we can't make sense of what it's been until we've moved through it and until we look back at it to really start to see these questions. Some of the ethical issues I brought up in this conversation, when we were first talking about digitization practices in the field, we were so concerned with making the argument that digitization was important 
that we didn't spend maybe as much time as we could have or should have to think about how we did digitization well and appropriately. There is, to some extent, only so much projection to identify the problems that you can do until we start to see what those problems are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, your explanation. And I, I was also, um, since you mentioned about how we were eager to digitalize, and one of the main tools that museums are using is digitizing their collection, opening the, uh, op sharing them with the public. And as a researcher also, I, I appreciate this a lot, especially who wrote her thesis uh, during the pandemic. Um, but also I was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts about, are there any drawbacks uh, sharing your collection online? Like, um, because we are always mentioning the positive side, but are there any drawbacks? Um. I don't think there are drawbacks with digitization in general, but specific objects and specific kinds of objects require specific care. Mm -hmm. So it's not appropriate to digitize everything. Again, I will use um, Indigenous objects and data as being really critical. You know, for a long time, a museum have had, well, you know, museums as institutions tend to have objects within their collections that were acquired without consent. They were acquired unethically. Sometimes they were stolen. These are legacies of um, many times trauma, but they're also legacies lacking consent and lacking permission. It's not appropriate for museums to make every decision or to make the decision about what can and can't be displayed. Some knowledge is sacred knowledge and sacred knowledge. Some objects are only meant to be viewed by initiated members of a community. Some objects should not be kept permanently. Um, one of the issues becomes when museums make decisions about digitization without putting um, care and consideration into the implications of it. There was a um, uh, a paired set of articles a few years ago um, from a librarian called Tara Robinson, uh, Robertson. I, and Robertson talks about um, the digitization of um, a lesbian erotic collection um, uh, of zines. And these were digitized and made available online. Mm -hmm. um, but they were created in a context of, you know, a, a small community. They were created on paper. They were created in a really different context. As these things are digitized, they can circulate differently and people's lives are differently affected. Mm -hmm. We now have moved to a time where we have facial recognition software that can be broadly deployed. It's, there are collections, there are objects that should not be digitized, or if they're digitized, they shouldn't be made public. Mm -hmm. But digitization as a broad kind of thing, I think has been really positive and really powerful. It hasn't limited people's interest in museums. If anything, it has increased them because people suddenly start to know what is in those museum collections. It hasn't um, limited research it's helped people connect to research like as you say yourself mm -hmm. um it's given us new kinds of research mm -hmm. but that's not to say that we should treat all digitization as equal there are also copyright considerations there are also um the fact that we are dealing with legacy institutions that are and legacy collections that are deeply imbalanced and ways that we can mm -hmm. we are then participating in reinforcing cultural biases but that is not a result of the digitization. That's a result of the legacies of the collections. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Um, thank you, thank you very much. And actually, mm. um, let me check our chat box. And if if I may, um, I have actually many things in my head, and also okay, great. Uh, you have mentioned about some things are gonna stay static in the museum field so, mm. it, do you have um, a 
brief answer to this or example about it? I was curious. Um, huh. So that was that was one of the answers that um, some of the people in our book would give about the ways mm -hmm. they thought that things might change. And uh, sort of at a basic level, institutions are difficult to change, in, intentionally so. Yeah. The reason we have institutions, the reason we have any kind of institution is to enable cultural persistence and perpetuation over time. It's actually important that museums are slow to change. It can be frustrating if you are someone who is um, progressive and seeking change, but it can be really important because we don't want to make a decision that destabilizes the uh, institution. We don't want to do these things quickly. It's actually reasonable that museums um, put thought and care into what they're doing because we're trying to create institutions that will be here 200 years into the future. So, so this idea of, you know, how they'll change and how they won't change, um, there's this constant act of negotiation that happens within museums. Um, in fact, the current writing I'm doing, I, I'm currently writing about how ethical practices within museums change. And I'm really interested in the process of negotiation that happens um, by different stakeholders and how different stakeholders um, gain power and legitimacy um, and also sort of move our understanding of what is ethically appropriate as a field. And time is actually an important factor in that. So it's not that I think that museums won't change, but I think that museums are seeking in the ways they change to balance the need to be relevant to different cultural contexts and technological contexts, and also not to do things in ways that are destabilizing. And so that necessarily requires some level of change, um, but also not not too quick and not too um, hastily and not without care. It is also important that we have legacy collections and legacy buildings, and that does give shape to the institutions that we have been and the institutions that we will be. But the way we deal with those legacies is actually a critical part of the work. Yeah, definitely. Thank you again um, for this wonderful talk and like bringing us all these different examples, like the and you know um, some of the concepts that you have mentioned are quite new to me. Although I'm working uh, in this field, uh, like. The been an example and also you have mentioned earlier in your talk about that how the book idea came out and I think mm -hmm. it's really the book itself really reflect that sincere uh, sincere small conversation uh, atmosphere mm -hmm. so I really appreciate that you uh, decided to took this format uh, when preparing uh, this book I really enjoyed uh, reading it and again thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us and thank you all for who are attending uh, and listening our seminar and I would like to give back the floor to Iram for the closing remarks thank you that's lovely can I Iram can I say one very quick thing quickly um you know I started by talking about sort of the experimental nature of the publication and Beza, I appreciate you bringing back. Uh, one thing I just wanted to say, and this is actually sort of a challenge to everyone, when I was going through university, when I was um, sort of a, a baby scholar, I often thought there was only one way to do scholarly work and there was only one way to do scholarly practice and that there were very specific kinds of writing that I needed to do. And um, it was really transformative for me as an academic and as a museum practitioner um, to come to realize that there are multiple ways of communicating knowledge and that there are many different ways that we can experiment with form as well as content. So my challenge to you, um, without knowing exactly who is here, um, it would be so lovely in the chat if, if people did want to sort of just 
um, as as you if you say goodbye also um, I'd love to sort of get a sense of who had been here but one of the things I would really love to encourage is that you think about the ways that you can also play with form as well as content um, and use that those kinds of experiments to unlock something different when Kia first brought me the idea of the book I was like oh no we can't do it that's not that's not how academic work needs to be done I, I was really resistant um and I'm so glad that Kia sort of helped me see that there is value in things that are sort of that change and challenge us formally as well as in terms of content so I sort of encourage you to to do the same as well and to really think about how you can use your strengths the things that excite you and you what the things that um you, you might be able to play with voice and narrative or, or context and, and in constructing the way you move your own work forward as well Thank thanks you. Adam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, it's really, it was really good to listen uh, your experience and your um, your thought about this topic. Uh, Anamet Library Talks will continue in August also. You can follow the details in our website and social media accounts. Thank you again and good evening to all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It's been so lovely to join you.